taking a look at cellular respiration. We're going to start with a couple concepts and a quick overview before we get into the actual steps. And we're going to look at glycolysis here, and then we'll take a look at some of the later steps thereafter. So we're going to start with kind of introduction and work our way upward from there. So as a, a real broad perspective and overview, cellular respiration, as you may be familiar, is a series of metabolic reactions or pathways in which the ultimate goal is to extract energy from organic molecules. So we all know that our food gives us energy. Specifically, that energy comes from the chemical bonds largely between carbon, hydrogen, and even carbon and oxygen bonds within our food. Organic molecules are made up largely of carbon and hydrogen. Things like sugar and fat are largely made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And these bonds have lots of energy. And so when we talk about extracting energy from our food, we're really specifically talking about deriving the energy from the chemical bonds themselves, which is potential energy, and converting that ultimately into a form of kinetic energy. And that's going to be done through a series of steps. It's not something that happens with one reaction or even two reactions, but more uh, on the order of several dozen reactions. And, and that's something that we're going to kind of simplify and look at not every single reaction, but some of the most uh, significant of those. But your food ultimately contains energy and chemical bonds. It starts out as what we refer to as macromolecules. And macromolecules are simply large molecules, large on a relative scale. These are things like proteins, carbohydrates, fats. And they are broken down bit by bit by chopping the macromolecule into smaller units known as monomer units. Um, there are different ways to define digestion, but this is largely what's happening in digestion in the stomach, for example, the small intestine, and to a certain degree in the, in the large intestine. But what's happening there is the, the large food particles are being slowly broken down into monomer units. Now, what happens inside the cells largely is where we see the chemical bond breakdown and the extraction of energy there thereof that we talked about on the last slide there, excuse me, where the chemical energy is extracted. This is something that largely happens inside of the cells as these monomers are broken down unit by unit. And this, this portion here is really what was taking place in cellular respiration. Digestion is something that's a little different and really a precursor, uh, in most cases anyway, to the actual metabolism via cellular respiration. Depends on what you're eating. But, that, but cellular respiration largely starts here. So as I alluded to already, cellular respiration is, occurs in stages. Partly this is simply because energy extraction is more efficient in stages. And from, a, from the theory of evolution, we see that any process that is more efficient tends to be that that wins out over the long haul. So in other words, if, you, if evolution creates two, two different scenarios, one that is more efficient than the other, the more efficient scenario tends to withstand longer and therefore ends up being what we see today. In other words, the weaker, lesser ideal of the two tend to die out. Um, that's only a partial explanation. But in general, the more steps, the, 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 the more stages of, of release, the higher the efficiency. Just to give it a quick comparison, Respiration yields about 34% of the total energy in, um, in a given f organic molecule, a food particle. 34% doesn't sound like a high yield, but in the grand scheme of things, in a relative perspective, that's actually fairly efficient. Uh, a gasoline engine maybe only gets about 25%, um, and, and some are more efficient than that. But in general, it, it it's a, tends to be on the relatively efficient side of things. And that has to do with the many steps, the multiple series of breakdowns. So here's your overall stages of cellular respiration. Um, there's technically four stages. So we're going to define it here with four stages. Really three of these are the biggest. And then this one here, number two, sometimes referred to as an intermediate reaction, kind of sneaks in between the bigger three here, which are glycolysis, Citric acid, citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, and then what's lastly, the electron transport chain. So it starts with glycolysis and moves in series through these other steps here. 
So we're going to talk about each of these, but we're going to focus on glycolysis today. Before we get into glycolysis, however, let's take a quick look at um, some of the things that are going to be happening here so we have a better idea of what's happening when, when we start to look at each step. As I've already indicated, our, our food contains energy. We're going to extract that energy. Specifically, that energy is going to be converted into what's called ATP. ATP is essentially a form of cellular currency in which energy is the currency, kind of like money in a, in a human society. So just like we need money for various things in our life, cells need ATP for various events in their existence. While there are many, we couldn't list all of them. Some examples include any sort of anabolic reaction, uh, movement, muscle contraction, and transport in and out of the cell. These are some of the most common. Uh, movement obviously entails a lot of different things. Muscle contraction, more advanced organisms. So you need ATP for uh, many, many things. When we look at how ATP is derived, we start studying the respiration by analyzing the breakdown of one of the most common organic molecules on Earth, and that is glucose. Now, glucose is not the only substance that can be broken down. We'll talk about that later, about other substances like proteins and fats that can be broken down. But glucose is one of the most common and is traditionally described as the starting point for understanding cellular respiration. So it, it kind of enters in the very beginning stages of cellular respiration, whereas other substances may enter in the later stages. So we'll, we'll talk, we'll come back to that. But ATP ultimately is derived from the breakdown of glucose as it moves through these various stages here. And this figure is fairly good. I got a lot of different figures of respiration here. But uh, we see here glucose is broken down in the cytoplasm or the cytosol. It's described here. This is a cell. This is the fluid of the cell. Glucose is broken down into what's called pyruvate. Pyruvate will be broken down into acetyl coenzyme A as it enters into the mitochondria, one of the organelles of our cell. Once it enters into the form of acetyl coenzyme A inside the mitochondria, it goes to the citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle yields products that enter into the electron transport chain where glucose is fully oxidized to form ATP. Now these numbers here will look a little different than ours. Um, there are different numbers that can be, uh, you can calculate different numbers from uh, ATP production. We're going to kind of look at what's often referred to as the maximum theoretical yield, which is 38. We'll come back to that. So we're driving ATP from glucose. What are, there are two ways that ATP can be formed, and we're going to take a look at those next. One of them that occurs first is called substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate fo level phosphorylation, I'll describe on the next slide, involves the extraction of a phosphate and that phosphate then being added directly to ATP. So you have phosphates from your food and they're added directly to ATP and certain enzymes carry this out. Oxidative phosphorylation is what takes place in the very end of cellular respiration and what's referred to as the electron transport chain. That's the last step. And I'll have a, another explanation on that here shortly. Substrate level phosphorylation, what you really need to know about this, because this is something you can talk a lot about, it's fairly complicated, but what you just really want to know is there are special enzymes that take, uh, that take care of this task, let's say. Um, these enzymes are called kinases. So there are different types of kinases, and they have different names, but they tend to have that word fit in there somehow. So a hexokinase, phosphofructokinase, um, phosphoglycerate kinase, pyruvate kinase, etc. Uh, pyruvate kinase is the one shown in the figure here. So they're all a little bit different, but what they ultimately do is they take an ADP molecule with only two phosphates and then a phosphorylated substrate of various types. And given their shape, they're allowed to fit together and they squeeze that phosphate onto the ADP, forming ATP. So it's a special enzyme that takes um, that takes a phosphorylated substrate and adds it directly to ATP. This is uh, something that uh, has evolved according to the theory of evolution uh, as an energetic enzyme to capture potential energy. So that's one way. Special enzymes pull phosphates directly from food. The other is a much more elaborate mechanism 
and I will describe this further at the end of the uh, lecture when we talk about the electron transport chain in a further video. I have just a quick summary of that here. Oxidative phosphorylation occurs in the presence of oxygen and involves a, uh, a chemical gradient in which hydrogen ions are concentrated on one side of a membrane and then diffuse through a special enzyme called ATP synthase. So once again, it's a special enzyme, but in this case, it's fueled by a concentration of H plus ions, which are also referred to as protons. Um, that's not a full explanation, so I'll come back to that later. I wasn't really trying to describe that in full here, but really just trying to describe the two types of ATP formation briefly, substrate level and oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so this, this based on this alone, won't make sense yet, but we'll come back to that later. What fuels the oxida oxidative phosphorylation and what fuels um, ultimately the majority of ATP production in cellular respiration are referred to as electron carriers. So just back up this real briefly here. This, this process here generates the majority of ATP within the cell. And that uh, occurs in a, in a, with a couple different things that are happening. Uh, this concentration gradient, the ATP synthase enzyme, but also with the help of electron carriers. Um, electron carriers will essentially strip some of the potential energy directly from our organic molecules like glucose and take that potential energy and temporarily shuttle it into these electron carriers, which will then, in the end of the process, fuel the pumping of these hydrogen ions and the production of ATP via ATP synthase. So this ATP synthase here runs off of these hydrogen ions and the, the, the fueling occurs through a concentration gradient. So there's a high concentration here and they diffuse to a low concentration gradient here and as they do that they move through this enzyme and the movement of that generates ATP as this enzyme creates ATP by taking a phosphate and ADP and joining them together. And what actually fuels the pumping of these hydrogen ions are these electron carriers, okay? Um, so as the energy as the energy comes from your, your food particles, that energy is charged to these electron carriers. So to summarize this here, electron, your, the energy from your food cannot be directly used to fuel ATP synthase. This thing right here is going to make the majority of our ATP. And it's going to use the energy from our food to do that, but Mother Nature has dictated that we can't take the energy from our food and directly fuel ATP synthase. What ends up happening instead is that energy is transferred to an electron carrier first and then transferred to this chain of events that ultimately fuel ATP synthase here, okay? Now, we'll make sense of that later, hopefully, but in the short term, let's focus on these electron carriers and, and think about what they do, and then we'll worry about how that contributes to ATP formation later. We gotta take this in steps here. Okay, so the electron carriers are, as the name indicates, molecules that literally carry electrons. Now, they also carry hydrogen ions, usually as a pair, they usually carry a proton and one or two electrons simultaneously, but we refer to them as electron carriers. That, that, that's kind of mis confusing. Essentially, they carry charged particles that have energy. It's probably the best way to think about it. But we call them electron carriers as one of the primary things they carry are electrons. The two most common and, and those relevant to, to cellular respiration are referred to as NAD and FAD. And those are uh, abbreviations or, or um, acronyms for larger for larger names that we're not going to mention here. So NAD and FAD for short. NAD is the most common and is the most uh, prevalent in cellular respiration. However, both of these are used throughout. Here's a real quick video on the next slide here, giving you a quick idea of how these work, and then I'll explain that a little bit more on the slide thereafter. Cells obtain energy during cellular respiration by oxidizing food molecules such as glucose. The energy derived from these oxidation reactions is used to form ATP.
Oxidation can be defined as the removal of hydrogens from a molecule. Since a hydrogen consists of a proton and an electron, a proton and an electron are removed during oxidation. Whenever a molecule is oxidized, hydrogens removed, another molecule must be reduced, hydrogens added to it. During an oxidation reduction reaction in the cell, an enzyme is involved in transferring the hydrogen, proton plus electron, to a coenzyme called NAD+. This enzyme has a binding site for both the substrate and NAD+. Once the substrate and NAD+, are bound with the enzyme, the hydrogen is transferred from the substrate to the NAD+. In other words, the substrate is oxidized, loses the hydrogen, and the NAD plus is reduced to NADH. As with all enzyme-mediated reactions, once the reaction is complete, the products separate from the enzyme and the enzyme can be used again. NADH, a high-energy electron carrier, diffuses away and is available to donate the hydrogen to other molecules. So as that video indicates, a molecule like NADH or NAD, excuse me, will essentially pull potential energy off of our food, described as the substrate there, and and hold on to that potential energy temporarily, and then as we'll see later, it will then transfer that energy uh, to. Let's go back here real quick. It will transfer this energy uh, ultimately to fuel this enzyme here that will make ATP. So as I mentioned, we can't directly transfer energy to the production of ATP via ATP synthase or oxidative phosphorylation. Instead, the energy is transferred to an intermediate, the uh, enzyme carrier here, NAD. And FAD works in a very similar way. Okay, We have special enzymes that will essentially take the NAD, that will take our substrate carrying the hydrogen to start with, and then facilitate the transfer so that now NAD will carry that extra hydrogen. Okay, Substrate will then now be lacking the hydrogen. It's said to be oxidized, and NADH is said to be reduced. So let's look at the terminology here real quick. This gets a little confusing, so you have to, may have to go back and look at this again. But uh, what we're looking at here is what's called a redox reaction, and a redox stands for oxidation reduction. Oxidation is a fancy term that refers to the loss of hydrogen, and, and reduction refers to the gain of hydrogen. Now, to be fair, I pulled these terms directly from our textbook and directly from that video there, actually, technically from that video. Um, if you look up what oxidation and reduction is often defined as, it often is defined as the, the loss and gain of electrons. Okay. Um, it just depends on the context as to how exactly how you describe it. The video there was talking about hydrogen, which is most relevant to the discussion of cellular respiration. Uh, in general, oxidation often refers to the loss of an electron. Reduction often refers to the gain of an electron. All that being said, what we're really talking about here is the transfer of potential energy. In the case of cellular respiration, that potential energy exists in the form of a hydrogen. And if you think back to our chemistry lesson, what a hydrogen atom is, is one proton and at least one electron. Now, there are different um, isotopes of hydrogen that may be a little bit different. But in general, a proton and an electron, sometimes even two electrons. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the transfer really involves those packets of energy, protons and electrons. Okay, and So depending on the context, you might state it differently. So for our discussion here, we're talking about hydrogen being uh, lost and gained. So let's just back up one more time real quickly here. So in a redox reaction, we have an enzyme that will take our substrate with the hydrogen. The enzyme will facilitate a redox reaction in which the substrate is oxidized to lose hydrogen and the NADH is reduced to gain it. Okay, and now we have some potential energy in the form of hydrogen being transferred there. And that's what a redox reaction is. And uh, this is how the, the, the early stages of energy transfer begin.
largely being transferred to our electronic carriers here. We now have reduced and unreduced forms. Or I should say we can introduce the terms reduced and, uh, and unreduced forms. Um, starting out, NAD and FAD, as they were described, excuse me, back here, these are what we refer to as unreduced. When they pick up a hydrogen, they become reduced. Now, the terms seem a little backwards if you're not familiar with them already. You think if you've, so, so just to clarify, when you're gaining something, the terminology is such that you're said to be reduced. The only way that actually makes sense is if you look back at the terminology here, when traditionally you're talking about electrons. So traditionally you gain an electron and are said to be reduced, and that's because electrons have a negative charge. Okay, So anyway, when you're reduced, you gain the, the electrons, in this case hydrogen, and when you're unreduced, you've lost those in the basic form. So NAD and FAD are the unreduced forms. NADH and FADH2 are the reduced forms. And FADH can actually hold two hydrogens, and hence the, uh, the two there. OK, so I know this stuff gets a little confusing. You may have to go back over it and look at those figures again. I'm jumping around here just a little bit. But those are some uh, of the basic terms here to understand what's going to happen later. A um, couple more things before we get into glycolysis. There are various forms of electron carriers. The soluble carriers, what we just mentioned there. There are a few other types that will occur in the ultimately in the electron transport chain later on in the process. I'm not really going to identify those, uh, so we won't worry about that for our discussion in this lecture. But just for um, quick discussion, there are different forms of electron carriers. The soluble types, NAD and FAD, and FAD, excuse me, are what we were talking about there. In the transport chain later, we have carriers that will pass electrons in a slightly different form. Okay, so now we're going to finally jump into glycolysis. We're going to take a look at it step by step. We're going to focus on um, the big picture first, what's happening, what are we going to get from it. We're going to take a look at each step, and we're going to kind of summarize the key steps before uh, we jump in the next video into the later stages of respiration. So here's another quick figure showing the starting point here, glycolysis, which is going to take place in the cytoplasm of a cell. So this is the fluid part of a cell, and um, this is where the process is going to begin. I don't talk a lot about the evolution of these pathways simply for the lack of time, but it is, my, it is interesting to note that glycolysis is, is one of the most, if not the most, primitive metabolic pathways that exist on Earth today. Every living organism conducts this pathway, and that is an indicator that it occurred in the very beginning stages of evolution, according to the, the theory of evolution. This pathway breaks down a molecule that is one of the most common forms of energy on Earth, which is glucose. Glucose is a, a simple sugar produced by photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is one of the most common forms of energy generating pathways on Earth. So it generates energy, uh, creating organic molecules from inorganic molecules. And the primary product of that pathway is glucose. It's no coincidence that that is then the starting product, starting um, substrate for this pathway as well. So photosynthesis and cell respiration, and especially glycolysis, are, are essentially polar opposites of each other in that the um, product of one is the starting point for the other. Glycolysis means sugar splitting, in which the sugar, glucose, is going to be split or broken down in the series of steps. Now, there are many steps to glycolysis. In fact, there's uh, 10 steps to glycolysis. But we can actually differentiate the majority of them into kind of two stages. And those two stages are referred to as the energy investment stage, which occurs early in the process, and then the energy harvesting or payoff stage, which occurs towards the latter steps in the process. Essentially, we refer to the first couple steps as the energy investment because 
during this time period, the cell actually inputs energy into glucose as a, as a precursor to extracting more out of it later. Um, you can maybe think of it like a business investment where you have to invest a little bit of money to make money later. That kind of that, that, that rule sort of applies here in glycolysis where the cell is actually going to input a little bit of energy as a way to actually extract more of it later. There's reasons why that happens. We don't get into every single nuance of, of this pathway. We just simply don't have the time. Uh, and, and, and so there are more um, specific reasons why that happens. But, but as a general rule, we invest energy uh, in order to extract more out of it later. So we can c consider glucose as being primed. And what that's a little, bit, a little bit more specifically what that means is we're actually investing two ATP per glucose molecule that enters the pathway. Okay, so that ATP then actually donates phosphate groups to the to the, the carbon uh, to the carbon atoms of the glucose, and that does so on each end of the glucose molecule. So our, our, our glucose is primed with phosphates from, AD, from ATP. So we call it the energy investment. Now, the later stages then are going to not only extract this phosphate back out, but it's also going to extract additional phosphate out. And we refer to this as the energy harvesting or payoff stage. And so from here, we're going to ultimately extract a total of four ATP. And uh, by the time we're done, we're going to have charged up two additional ATP compared to what we uh, input at the beginning step, beginning steps. So as a quick overview, we're going to invest two ATP, we're going to get four total out of it, and that's going to give us a net yield of two ATP per glucose. And that's the quick overview of glycolysis. In addition to the two net ATP, we're also going to charge up two NADH so we're going to reduce two different NAD to NADH, the electron carriers. And we're also going to be left with uh, some of the organic carbon molecules at the end, which are now going to be referred to as pyruvate. So we get two ATP, two NADH, and two pyruvate per glucose that enters the pathway. And this is a very basic figure of what that looks like here. So here's the starting. Here's the split. Here is the end results. Okay, so the first step in glycolysis is what's known as the phosphorylation reaction. So it's described as the phosphorylation of glucose. So this is one of the, the portions of the energy investment where uh, we have an enzyme that's going to take energy in the form of a phosphate from ATP and add that to glucose, creating what's called glucose 6-phosphate. So we have glucose. The 6 is in reference to the, to the carbon number that it's added, and then the phosphate is what we're adding. So we're adding a phosphate to the 6-carbon of glucose, and the name becomes glucose 6-phosphate. Remember earlier I talked about kinase enzymes and, and the, uh, the role they play being adding phosphates transferring phosphates uh, via substrate level phosphorylation. Um, so this is essentially kind of the reverse of that actually where the enzyme is rather than adding it is taking um, a phosphate um, from ATP that is and adding it directly to the substrate. Okay so um, the enzyme here is hexokinase. The reaction is a phosphorylation of glucose and this is the first step of glycolysis. Now once this happens, glucose is actually kind of trapped in the cell. For various reasons, that phosphate makes it very difficult for glucose to exit back out of the cell, which it might otherwise be able to do. And so this becomes somewhat of an irreversible reaction in which glucose is now somewhat designated. Uh, I shouldn't say it's guaranteed to be broken down. It might end up in, uh, for example, glycogen, but uh, it does prevent it from easily leaking back out of the cell. Step two involves what's called an isomerization. So isomerization of glucose. Um, technically, we're talking about the isomerization of glucose 6-phosphate. An isomerization is a reaction in which you take the carbon atoms that you already have, and the, the other atoms for that matter, the hydrogen and the oxygen in this case, and the phosphate, and 
we just rearrange it into a slightly different form. And and so we see here we now have a molecule called fructose, and 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 because it can it still carries the phosphate on the six carbon, we call it fruc fructose six phosphate. Um, you know, fructose. Think of uh, high fructose corn syrup. Fructose is a fruit sugar, and um, the only real difference between fructose and glucose is the exact arrangement of the carbon and the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms in the molecule. They are essentially um, carbon copies of each other, and, and so they're actually referred to what are called uh, um, isomers, meaning the same number of atoms in a different form. So isomerization, the enzyme here is phosphoglucose isomerase. The name of the enzyme indicates its function, and all we've really done is change the form from one to another. Step three involves uh, an additional uh, phosphorylation reaction in which now fructose 6-phosphate is phosphorylated with another ATP. So we're still in that energy investment stage. Um, now we're going to add a phosphate to the number one carbon, and so we're going to have what's called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Um, bi meaning two, once again phosphate, fructose with the phosphate on the one and the six carbon. The enzyme here is phosphofructokinase. Once again, a kinase enzyme involved in transferring phosphates. All we've really done here is charge the atom, charge the atoms, the carbon itself up, and change the form into to different uh, different isomers. But again, just connecting back here real quick, we we're still in this energy investment stage, and we're getting ready to exit out of that in which this molecule is going to split, okay? So in steps four and five, we have a cleavage and another isomerization of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So there's an enzyme here called fructose bisphosphate aldolase that is going to essentially break this chain of carbons right here in the middle. And what that's going to do is it's going to generate two three carbon molecules from the one fructose, excuse me, from the one glucose ultimately that we started with, but from the fructose that we have in this previous step. What we're going to now have are slightly different three carbon molecules, each with a different name. So one is called dehydroxyacetone phosphate, the other is called glycyaldehyde 3 phosphate. What is going to happen immediately after? So that so that's step four. Just to clarify, the, the cleavage is step four. Uh, the cleavage results in these two molecules here. Turns out that glyceraldehyde three phosphate is the one that we want going into the next set of reactions. So after step five, um, we're going to need glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So we have one glyceraldehyde three phosphate. What's going to happen in step five? is this dehydroxyacetone phosphate is going to be converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So we're essentially going to break this molecule into two different types and then dehydroxyacetone phosphate is going to be immediately converted or I shouldn't say immediately but at some point it's going to be converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So moving forward we're going to have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate G3P for short and each one of those now going back up here one more time, each one of those now is going to be acted upon separately. So this is where we have a split here. This is referred to as a divergent pathway. So we're diverging down two separate paths and each G3P is going to be reacted upon independently of the other. But they each started from the same glucose so we kind of talk about them um, based on the starting point of their, of their, uh, of their origin. Okay, so here reiterating that glucose is a divergent pathway. One molecule splits into two, each is reacted upon separately. Here we're seeing this is the dehydroxyacetone phosphate being converted to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Each now is reacted upon separately. So they're reacted upon separately, but the, the steps are identical. So what's going to happen to one is going to happen to the other in, um, in, in mirror fashion. So to clarify, uh, for each glucose that starts, we now have two pathways that are going to have the same uh, series of steps 
for each G G uh, glycerolamide three phosphate. That they just have it. This this should be G three P. This is a different figure I pulled off the web here. Uh, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is what they're indicating there. Okay. Okay, step six is an important step. Glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is kind of a key molecule in cellular respiration. Um, the splitting generates ultimately two of them. And so not only is that kind of a key step, as we'll see later on in, in a future video towards the end of this, Proteins can be converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Uh, so, other forms of energy can enter into the pathway here. Um, and, and also, we're going to have another reaction here that is key, and that is going to add phosphate to this molecule. So, so glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is kind of a key intermediate in glycolysis for a variety of reasons. Let's focus on one reason in particular I just mentioned there, and that is that phosphate. Is going to be added to this molecule, giving it an additional phosphate group. And that's going to happen for each of the glyceraldehydes that we st uh, created in the previous step there. Okay? So, looking ahead here, phosphate is what we're ultimately going to use to charge up and make ATP. And as I said earlier, we have to spend two ATP to start this. We're going to pull those back out. So of the four ATP we're ultimately going to produce, two of those are essentially just recycled from the ATP that we spent up here. The other two, however, come from the phosphate that is added in this reaction right here. So there's a key enzyme here called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. What it's going to do is pull a phosphate from the environment and add it to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And what that's going to do is change it now to a molecule called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. The 1 and the 3 represent the carbon atoms that the 2-bi-phospho uh, are added to, the base of which is glyceraldehyde, now referred to as glycerate. So we have that base glycerate, 2 phosphates added in the 1,3 position. And now we've got twice as many phosphates that we started with. And as we'll see in the next steps, these are going to be extracted back out and used to make ATP. So that's why this is a key step. Uh, one of the reasons why. So for now, we're focusing on the reason here being we have the addition of a phosphate that's going to make this, it's going to make it so that we can pull more ATP out of this than what we started with. Okay. The next step is where we actually start to do that. We start to extract the ATP back out. So step seven is a phosphorylation of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, and that phosphorylation means we're going to add a phosphate, one of, the, one of the ones that we just added. We're going to pull that back off and add it to ADP to make ATP. This enzyme is called phosphoglycerate kinase, another kinase enzyme here involved in, in the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. Okay, this is going to happen twice per glucose. So we now have actually generated two ATP and we're back to um, even from where we started with at the beginning of the pathway. We now have a molecule with only one phosphate in the three carbon and it's now referred to as three phosphoglycerate. Step eight is another, is another isomerization of three phosphoglycerate. Uh, the, the, phospho, the phosphate is not essentially going to change positions. This happens for various technical reasons that are somewhat arbitrary. We're not going to focus on that. Kind of a, a, a step that gets lost in translation. Isomerization, change the, the uh, phosphate position. The next step involves a dehydration. We're going to remove water from this, and that's going to change the chemistry a little bit of the molecule. Nothing too key here, so not, not a major step. But step nine is a dehydration. We change 2-phosphoglycerate uh, to a molecule called phosphoenol pyruvate. The last step involves the um, final phosphorylation. We're going to take the remaining phosphate group and we're going to transfer that to another ADP to form ATP once again.
Uh, this is going to give us the final product of glycolysis called pyruvate, sometimes referred to as pyruvic acid. The enzyme here is called pyruvate kinase. And once again, this yields us our final ATP of the pathway. Backtracking here just a, a quick bit to overview. We invested two ATP. We charged our glucose. We split it. We added more phosphate. We stripped that back off, and we ended up with 1, 2, 3, 4 ATP after we invested 2. We have a net of 2 ATP. Some of the key steps. The phosphorylation of glucose in step 1 is an irreversible step that traps glucose within the cell. Step 6, the oxidation of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Key intermediate step also involves the addition of phosphate. Step 7 and 10 are the, the steps then that give us a net yield of ATP, uh, giving us a total of 4 ATP per glucose in the end there. 4 ATP is the gross, 2 ATP is the net, to clarify. So those are some of the key steps in glycolysis. We're summarizing the yield once again, 2 net ATP. NADH is, is uh, reduced in the process, or NAD is reduced to NADH. We, that happens... Um, uh, twice per glucose and at the end we have two pyruvate molecules that contain potential energy left over okay now real quick just so this is the the yield that we have simple organisms like certain bacteria for example um, even our own cells at times can fuel all of their needs simply off of glycolysis so when you have a lot of sugar in a lot of, of basic carbohydrates, like fructose, you can essentially run your entire cell off of just glucose and just glycolysis. The, the amount of energy that you extract is very little, but if you have a lot of energy, you can essentially um, you can make do. Think of it like a car that gets like five miles to the gallon. It's not ideal to drive a car that gets five miles to the gallon, but if that's all you got and you got a ton of gasoline, you can get it done. It's not ideal, but if gas is like five cents a gallon, hell, you can go pretty damn far with, with a car that gets five miles to the gallon. That's kind of how glycolysis can be in certain situations. It's very ineffective, but for some organisms, they have a lot of glucose, Glucose is cheap. It's like getting gas for five cents a gallon, and they can make do with it. So, this pathway is is again one of the most primitive. It exists in all cells, and for some organisms, it's really the primary form of energy that they that they their primary um, generator of energy. It's not efficient, but it works. Now, where evolution took this further, according to the to the theory of evolution, is that it it states that cells began to extract more of the energy since we have some left over in pyruvate. So pyruvate contains lots of potential energy. It hasn't fully been broken down. But if you look at what glucose glycolysis does, it, it leaves all that energy left behind. But as cells evolved more efficiency, one of the ways that that efficiency manifested was to break that potential energy down further. And so what you see in the, in the next series of steps in cellular, in cellular respiration is um, different mechanisms of breaking that potential energy from pyruvate down further. Okay, And that's really what happens. Uh, in general, that tends to happen in the presence of oxygen. There are some organisms that can actually do it anaerobically. But typically, you'll see that described as in the presence of oxygen. And that's kind of how we're going to look at it here. So that's going to summarize, that's going to do it for this video here. We'll come back in the next step, the next series, and we'll take a look at uh, pyruvate oxidation, and we'll take a look at um, the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Okay? But we'll go ahead and wrap it up for, for now, and we'll come back to this later.